Now is the time to say so. All right, this meeting is recording. All right, well, again, good evening, everyone. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Happy New Year. Um, luck and prosperity for, uh, for all of you. My name is Teo Lachev, and this is going to be the January 4th, 2021 meeting for our Atlanta Microsoft BI and Power BI group that has been around for more than 10 years now. As usual, do we have any actually new people? Somebody new, new member who, who's joining for for the first time? Our meetings. OK. Get up. I think Jonathan raised a hand. Pam, I don't know. Grace, maybe you can put in the chat window. Yeah, so I'm new to this group. Um, I've been a software developer for about 25 years. Mm -hmm. And about 10 years ago, I worked on a product with a SQL Server backend and got really addicted to all things SQL Server and went to past meetings and went to SQL Saturdays. And then the last four years, I haven't been working on a product mm -hmm. SQL backend. So I've just been studying and trying to keep up the skills that I developed while I worked on that project. Awesome. Thank you, Pam. Appreciate it. Uh, you probably know that there also there is another group in Atlanta called Atlanta.MDF. Um, MDF stands for Microsoft Database Forum, I believe. They're actually much older group than us. In, in fact, initially, our group and that group were, you know, we were covering both SQL Server and BI, and then we decided to split because there was so much interest in BI. So if you are interested in SQL Server development, just the database engine side of things, then I highly recommend you also take a look at Atlanta.mdf. Um, they also meet at the Microsoft Office when times are good. The second Monday, we meet on the first Monday of the month. They meet on the second Monday actually, but now everything is remote. Great. Um, so outside atlanta do we have people from from any place else outside georgia actually let's just put it this way any other states or even other countries i'm in tennessee <laughs> tennessee okay well it looks like you're gonna win the award uh but let's see oh we have uh, I am, uh, sorry ontario canada Canada, Canada now wins the prize for the furthest location. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Cool. So as usual, what I'm going to do, I'm going to actually go through a few uh, housekeeping things, kind of news and announcements to get us started. Then I'm going to show you the latest, some of the latest features that we have in Power BI. And then we're going to talk about Azure Data Lake, which is, in my opinion, very, very important technology. I use it pretty much for any um, BI project. We're going to talk a little bit about that. So the first thing I want to start, you guys maybe got my email. Um, unfortunately, the organization that we are affiliated with, so I'm going to start with kind of a negative news, unfortunately, but uh, it we learned, um, I would say about two weeks ago, that PASS is kind of shutting down. PASS has been an iconic um, operation, um, organization. Um, it's been, you know, operating for many, many years. Don't know exactly what happened there, but looks like COVID kind of impacted their budget, um, I guess, uh, budget situation, and they just decided to shut down. And I've been trying for the past 10 days to get in touch with them, ask them what's going to happen with our little site that we have there. Um, no reply, so I would assume the worst. I would assume that after January 15th, which is in 10 days, they're going to shut down everything, so we got to move. So speaking about moving, we are exploring a couple of options. Dynamic communities um, is um, kind of a community-oriented organization, and I know Microsoft and dynamic communities have been trying to influence us for a while to move our website to their um, hosting. Um, 
So that's one option, uh, not to mention that they're actually rebuilding the whole thing, so hopefully they're going to make it better. Um, so was supposed actually to go live today, but um, I was I just don't know what happened in there. So that's one option. Ors come to Ors. I would encourage you to. So we have three sites. <laughs> now you understand why redundancy is so important. So um, if not for anything else, you can. I encourage you to register on Meetup. Um, in and here I'm giving you the link. So that if pass shuts down and dynamic communities is being delayed, at least we have a way to kind of communicate with you and let you know about the uh, future meetings and so forth. So that's the situation with pass. I'm also trying to salvage as many resources as I can. So from the download section, I'm down. I kind of downloaded the presentations and things like this. Hopefully, we can upload them to the new site once it's ready. Cool. Other than that, we continue um, in our operations. You know, uh, nothing affected in mean, this past situation doesn't affect our meeting. We continue to meet and we typically meet on the first Monday of uh, every month unless it falls on a holiday. Got it. Other than that, if you get value from this meeting, spread the word. Um, this link here is for where you can find our recordings. So when we moved offline, we start recording our meetings. And um, if you go there, you'll see our prior meetings. Everything, it's uh, all the recordings are in there. If you want to get involved, always looking for help. Who knows what's going to happen around that site? Maybe there has to be all kind of help that I'll need. So let me know if you're willing to um, you know, willing to help and if you're willing to present, always looking for speakers. Um, I want to ask you, does anybody have any um, announcement as far as job openings? Anybody looking for BI, Microsoft BI talent? Hey, uh, this is Lawrence Guillory. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called Real Theory. And we have some job openings um, for data architect and data scientist. It's only five hours a week minimum. Um, we're a really unique model. We're 30 engineers in total. We're building a platform that builds for um, fully autonomous applications that are running Kubernetes in the cloud. We're backed by Microsoft uh, and AWS. And um, if you're interested, uh, you can hit me up in this meeting. I'll be here. The data lake caught my attention because we're actively building out a, uh, a data lake in Azure right now and also building one out in AWS. So if you've got some sort of experience, but you're uh, in a legacy environment, and you're wanting to build that out and you've got the interest for five, 10 hours a week, uh, we've got a program that uh, fits that and um, it's very effective. Awesome. Well. That's great, Lawrence. If you can uh, put the link, more information in the chat window, I really appreciate it. So yeah, somebody, yeah, somebody says I'm not able to hear anything. Is anyone experiencing the same issue? Um, I hope you guys can hear me. Um, so I don't know what's with Nas. Maybe somebody can reply, give him some tips to go to the settings in Teams, check his connections and all that. Anybody else looking for BI talent? BI job openings? Anything you want to advertise? Guess not, so we're going to move on. Um, OK, so this actually was supposed to be a hidden slide, but somehow popped up. No events. I mean, um, no, nothing actually caught my attention. Um, is Damo on this meeting? Anybody has any? Any, any interesting events that um, want to advertise to the community? Anything happening around BI? All right, move on. Cool. So the next thing, some Power BI developments and Microsoft BI developments in general since the last time we met that caught my attention. 
So we have some a very exciting feature that will change. Actually, um, I think this is a huge feature and I really like it. I did uh, my own testing, but we have direct query for Power BI data sets and Azure analysis services. So I'm going to show you a demo in a moment why this feature is, uh, I believe, is so it's so useful. But to me, for the past month, this is the biggest, the biggest, um, um, I guess, announcement. We have a cool feature for business users called small multiples, and the best way to understand it is to see it in action. I'm going to show you a little demo of that. Then we have a couple of enhancements in Power BI service. Uh, we have something called Dataset Hub to make it convenient for developers and users to see their data in one place. We have also option to create uh, this actually feature, the fourth one probably is going to be more appealing for business users, somebody who has a data set and they want to create a report real quick from it without actually using Power BI desktop. So I'm going to show you a little bit how that works. And the last feature is um, you guys know about Power Automate. We talk quite a bit of that. You know, you know that Power, probably Power BI is a part of the um, what Microsoft calls Power Platform, which consists of Power BI, Power Apps, Power Automate, and virtual agents. So Power Automate, previously known as Microsoft Flow, is about creating workflows. Let's say email comes in. If it has this subject, I want to do something, I want to query database and, you know, pretty sophisticated workflows. So you know that Power BI has a connector to Power Apps and we spoke previously in previous meetings. In fact, I show you some demo. Why is this cool? So now we have a connector for Power Automate. What does it mean for you? Um, this connector, by the way, it's only available as it stands for data flows. Data flow, what is data flow? Sales service ETL, you go to Power BI, create data flow to move data. Think of it like Power Query in the cloud. So if you have a data flow and if you go and connect your data, now you're going to see this Power Automate connector. Guys, there is some kind of a background noise. I would apologize if you can mute yourself um, unless you want to ask a question. So you have a data flow. You want to actually this data flow to be triggered when Power Automate workflow maybe starts or something like that. Now you can do that with this Power uh, Automate connector. All right. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to actually go through the previous four features, starting with the query to Power BI datasets and Azure Analysis. I'm going to show you a little demo uh, that I've got here somewhere. Actually, let's go and build one from scratch. So we're in Power BI Desktop, and here is my scenario. Maybe I work for an organization that uses Power BI, and um, we've got data sets in Power BI service. Some of them contributed by business users, Cell Service BI. Some of them could be from organizational semantic models that are sanctioned and developed by IT. So I'm a business user and I know that there is kind of a data set out there, a semantic model, um, maybe deployed to Power BI. So I go in there to Power BI Datasets Connector. And um, once this thing loads, if I have access to that data set, I should be able to see it in the list. And I should be able to consume it. Don't know why it's taking so long. Let's give it some time. Any questions so far? Display power. Okay. Yeah, there. Finally, come back. All right. So, I, I'm a business user. I know that there is some kind of a data set. Uh, guys, could you please uh, mute yourselves? There is some background noise. Um, I appreciate that. Thank you. 
All right, so for example, here I see that there is a promoted data set in the sales department workspace. I'm going to select it. I'm going to connect to it. You can do this, um, uh, you know, in Power BI, and many of you probably have done this already, you know, connect to existing data set. But before this feature, a big limitation in Power BI was that um, once you connect to a published data set, Power BI data set, or to Azure Analysis Services, that's pretty much it. Your Power BI desktop cannot create other connections. So if you try, for example, to bring some additional data to mesh it up with your uh, data set, data set published by somebody else, you, 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 you were not able to do that. You know, it was just limitation of Power BI. And the reason for this was that when we connect to analysis services in each one of its permutations, uh, publish data set in Power BI, that's Azure Analysis Services behind the scene, Azure Analysis Services or SQL um, or Analysis Service on-prem, then Microsoft uses actually a very lightweight mechanism to connect called live connection. In this case, Power BI desktop turns like a, becomes like a presentation layer. Uh, there are no additional layers in between. Power Query is not available. Um, you know, essentially Power BI desktop is just the UI layer on top of analysis services. So that mode was kind of limiting because it was limited to one connection. But, you know, it's very common in real life to say, okay, great, somebody built a data set for me. And again, this could be IT, could be another business user, but I want to enrich it. I want to enhance it with my own data, right? So now we can actually do this. We could, let's say, just to demonstrate this scenario, I'm going to get another data set. That in here. So here I have a CSV file. I'm just going to open this and look at that. So for example, let's say that model that I'm connecting is for sales, revenue oriented model, but it has only actual sales. I want to compare actual against budget, right? And the budget, it's not in the semantic model. It's not in the data set. It's outside. So I want to mesh it up. So now what I can do, the first thing that we have to do, this is a preview feature. So we have to actually enable it. How do we enable it? We go to the, to the Power BI settings. We go to the preview features and we make sure that direct query for Power BI data sets and analysis services is actually enabled. All right, so that's step number one. Then once we've done this, we're going to go to, since this is a text file, I'm going to go in here. And at this point, if you, in fact, if you enable that feature, all the other connectors are going to be disabled. You know, previously they were enabled, but when you try to use a, another connector, you're going to get a message saying that, oh, I'm sorry, that's the end of the uh, road for you because you already connected to um, analysis services. But now we have this prompt that says, hey, if I want to make a changes, if I want to add additional sources, you have to switch to direct query connection. So when I click this yellow button here, magic happens behind the scenes. Instead of live connection, we're switching to direct query. Power BI desktop is going to import the metadata of that model, which this is a good thing because it also allows you to make changes to the fields. Um, changes meaning that in your local Power BI desktop file, you can, you can rename fields. They never, the changes that you make never impact the published data set. They're always local to, um, to your Power BI desktop file. Uh, you can also create calculated columns. So because we are switching to the direct query, some additional options are available. But what's even more exciting is that now I can actually build a composite model that consists of uh, the published data set or Azure Analysis Services Cube, mesh it up together with this text file in this case. And all is great. 
Okay, we have a warning about potential security risks, which we'll happily dismiss. Uh, and the reason why it's prompting this is because now that you have two data sources, maybe some information could be sent to another data source. It's just warning. Cool. So now let's go and switch to our uh, relationships and see what happened in there. I'm going to click upgrade now, which is another new feature, so we get a better relationship view. And here is our fact sales quota in here. Uh, this is very small. You probably can't see anything. Just make it bigger. All right, so where is our fact sales quota? It's not related right now. But fear not, we could go ahead and create relationships just like these tables came from one database. You know, there's nothing stopping us here to create hybrid relationships. So just to understand what's happening. So this fact sales quota was from my text file. We are creating relationship to the, the published data set. Uh, so we're going to create one for the uh, date and another one on the employee. Apparently quota is being recorded on for the salesperson and for the um, at the quarter or year level. Where is the employee key here? Key employee right here. OK, so we're going to drag and drop this guy in here. We're going to drop it into the employee table because we need these two relationships. And now everything we are ready to actually start going create reports. So we're going to switch to report view. We're going to go from the semantic model. Maybe what I can do, I can say go ahead and uh, maybe from the reseller sales table. Um, let's go and select this field sales amount. So this is from the published data set. And then we're going to also go to the fact sales quota. And we're going to add sales amount quota. So this is our budget, which came from the text file. And there we go. So, and because we have a relationship to employee and the day table, I could go ahead and add the uh, calendar hierarchy in here. And from that point on, it's just slicing and dicing that data. What do you guys think? Isn't that a cool feature? Can you connect? Oh, there is a lot of interest here. Let's see, composite data model. This is a great update. Yep, I agree with you. Very, very important. So I can tell you from my consulting experience, talking to clients, this is one of the requirement number one. It pretty much the larger the organization, the more IT wants to have control for semantic model. So they maintain some of the important ones, but they want to allow the user to enhance them. So maybe somebody maintains a spreadsheet or something. Uh, maybe a dimension, maybe a different way to group things. You know, just add that data now. You can create the, the relationship and you're good to go. With a caveat, Nitin said that it breaks the role level security in the published data set. The published data set, the security, so this is a good observation. Um, he's, uh, he's talking about role level security. So what about if the guys, I'm going to mute you because we still have some background noise. So sorry. Um, if you uh, if you want to ask a question, please unmute yourself. So Nitin is saying, you know, what about if the published data set has a role level security, data security? So that security is still going to work within the published model, right? But it's not going to propagate, at least for now, it's not going to propagate to the to the other data sets, right? So let's say I'm securing on the employee dimension and that's in the published data set, but I want the user to be able to see only the budget for, for the employees that are authorized to see. Right now, Nitin is right. We cannot do that. So this is a limitation. Hopefully Microsoft will propagate RLS in future. Yeah, there are a few more to you. Uh... So like if you have created certain uh, folders or structure or uh, uh, especially on the date hierarchies that that's also gets uh, messed up in the composite model. Uh, just observations that I had since the day I have played it with this new feature. Okay. Uh, 
pretty pretty neat i would say uh, definitely the feature that i was looking for for very long but uh, rls security and the 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 hierarchy structures has kind of thrown us off so for that hierarchy structure can you tell me um, one more time what the what the issue is so uh, so at least the observation that we had is like a, if if we have created a certain uh, uh, hierarchies within mm -hmm. the data mentions uh, like you know created data entity created hierarchy and when we when we uh, create a published model and we use that with another we try to blend it with another source those hierarchies gets dropped off automatically uh, they don't appear in that composite model so well, that's exactly what I did here, right? So I have a hierarchy, calendar hierarchy, which I added to the chart. And from that point, I should be able to drill down so the hierarchy works. So which part doesn't actually work, right? Is it the default hierarchy or the one that you created? Uh... It's it's in the published model. So it's uh, the date dimension. It's in the in the, the model that I connected to. And I have a hierarchy in here. Are you talking about something else? Uh, this was this is interesting because in our model we and exactly this was for us we we were not able to uh, use the published especially the date dimension hierarchy so I need to hmm. uh, yeah investigate that. I mean maybe yeah. maybe the relationship is missing here but as long as you have a relationship just like yes, we have yes yes this one. Definitely not. It was not related to uh, any relationships, but uh, right. uh, hierarchies. Yeah. Uh, cool. Great. So, any other questions about this? Let's see. Uh, so, all three could be published data sets, but two will be direct query. So you can mi you can mix and match this any way you want. You could, um, you know, that published model now is in direct query, which means that just like before. Every time you do something on the report, Power BI sends DAX queries to that model. So now it works a little bit different. There is another layer uh, between the Power BI and the published model, but the behavior is kind of the same. The other, the external data, you can do whatever you want. It could be direct query. It could be imported. Essentially, you're building a composite model uh, behind the scenes and, you know, it works just like any other composite model in Power BI. I keep learning how excited people are for this feature, but I'm not clear as to why this is better than building the model correctly. <laughs> okay, well, I guess the short answer, um, Clayne, Nathaniel actually apologize, is the because building the model correctly for the first time, it's a very difficult thing to do. So you imagine you have a IT, you got developers, they're under pressure, they have a data warehouse, they're building stuff. The moment they build a cube, it's obsolete. You know, when, especially when people start uh, looking at it, they're going to say, oh, but we need to do that. We need to do. So now I got to wait for the the developer to go and actually spin ETL processes, you know, to populate that, populate data warehouse. So I actually can put that data into the uh, into the data warehouse and therefore in the in the data set. This gives you a flexibility. You can say, great, I know my model is not complete. I can actually put it out there, whatever I've got. And because user is going to use it in so many different ways. I'm going to let them do it. I'm going to actually uh, allow them to mash up their data with my model. And then if this is useful for other users, then I can in time, I can incorporate those changes to make my model even more useful. Right? Because BI never stops. You know, there is always requirements. People are always hungry for new things. Yeah, agile model development. Yes, OK. I thought it was a long this long. Very good. Cool. So now the next feature. So now we have this ugly looking chart. What about if I want to break this chart by something? Like, for example, I want to break it by product category. I want to be able to analyze actuals versus budget by a calendar year, but also by product category. So. We have a feature now called small multiples. And we have a new area in the visualization pane right here. 
So how is that cool? It's very cool because I could go to my product dimension and I can do what? I can, where's my product category? It's right here. I can drag it and drop it. I drag it, drop it. And what happens with our chart? It breaks now into four charts. Because we have four categories. Actually, we have, yeah, four categories. Accessories, bikes. So it's a pretty cool feature. So we used to have that feature, those of you who are following Microsoft BI for a long, long time like me, probably remember there was a tool called Power View, which was supposed to be the hardest thing in BI. It didn't work so well though for it. But that feature, multiples, was there, and it took what is, it took six years until we got it into Power BI, but we now have it. So just put something in the multiples, and it, in fact, you can put actually multiple fields, and it's going to keep on breaking down this chart into smaller and smaller charts side by side, which can be cross-highlighted just like any other visual. So for example, if I have slicers, filters, it's going to apply to all of them. Cool. All right, quickly covering the other two features, uh, we will now go to Power BI service. Where we see what? We see the menu on the left side has been actually extended with two features. First one is called data sets. The second one is create. Data sets are for Microsoft, what Microsoft wants to do here is kind of make it convenient for both developers, people who are creating uh, data sets, and users to see um, all the data that they have access to in one place. Instead of going workspace by workspace, looking at the data sets in there, you know, just put it in one place. So here in this list, they see all the data sets that I have access to. I could um, see more information about the data set. For example, when was last refreshed? I could have additional options. I can start creating reports from it, but it's pretty easy to understand. You know, this data set, Microsoft called this data set, data sets hub in Power BI. One place for all of your data to go there and see everything that you, all the data that you have access to. Uh, that feature create, it's, a feature that targets um, business users who are not that, um, I would say, skillful to go and use Power BI Desktop because it's too complicated for them. But then imagine they have a requirement going back to my quarter. Let's say they have a file, Excel file or CSV file that somebody gives to them. They want to visualize it. They want to actually create some cool reports on top of it. So with this create feature, what we allow, what Microsoft allows us to do is to just copy and paste that data. And Power BI is going to create the data set directly in Power BI service. Uh, and so we can jump to creating reports. So we have two options, copy and paste for now and connecting to existing data set. Again, the goal is to bypass Power BI desktop. Now, if this is a good practice or not, that's a different story. Because what happens if I bypass Power BI desktop and start creating reports in Power BI service? Well, when my helpful administrator comes along and says, oh, who created that report? Let's go and delete it. Then my, that, this report is lost forever. So in Power BI service, we don't have a, a recycle bin or anything like this. If you create artifacts directly in Power BI service, you always risk that you're going to lose them, right? Um, so although it's not a good practice, let's go and see what happens in here when I click that button. All right, so now I get to Power Query interface. So this is like Power BI in the desktop. So what I can do, let's go and copy all of this uh, fact sales quota. And let's go and paste them, Control V, right? We copy Control C and we copy with Control V. And then let's go ahead and say, oh, the first row actually should be the column headers. Let's go and maybe uh, let's leave it like this table. So this is limited. You're not creating. So um, please don't get confused here. That doesn't mean that we are bringing Power BI desktop to service. 
This is limited to one data set. There are no relationships here, no ability to create DAX calculations in all of this, at least not in the um, right from the very beginning. But we can create that data set pretty quickly by copying and pasting. And then, now when I tried that feature for some reason, it took a very long time to get to this. Maybe we still have some bugs in here. Actually, this one was pretty quick. So not only actually I copied and pasted my, my data, but Power BI automatically creates some visualizations for me. It looked at that data set. It said, oh, you have some numeric fields. Let's go ahead and aggregate them. The sales amount is being aggregated. So it created some reports for me. Uh, but I can go ahead and customize it. So, for example, if I want to also see the uh, whatever that field is in here, I can include it in the report. I can save that report. I can edit it. Um, I can switch to edit mode. And from that point on, that brings me to all the visualization capabilities that we have in Power BI. So, can create relation, uh, create reports by copying and pasting data now something that your business users may like. What do you guys think? Are you excited? Very excited. Can you download PBI? Yep, so very good question. Can I download? Because who asked that question? Uh, Andy. Andy, listening to me, said, OK, that's not a best practice. What about if somebody deletes it? Can I, down, can I back up this report? Yes, you can. You could um, actually hold on a second. Let's go ahead and save it. First, we're going to call this report. We're going to put it in my workspace. We're going to call it tail, uh, let's say paste report, something like this. We're going to save it. And then now that we save it, we can go to the file and we can download the file. Yes, you can. So the, that's the answer. You can download it and you can back it up that way. Any other questions for me? All right. Then what I'm going to do, I'm going to switch to the main presentation for the data lake. In my opinion, before I introduce the uh, presenter, James, are you online? Yes, I am here. <laughs> Thank you, James. Before I introduce you, I just want to say that what James is going to show you is, um, in my opinion, very useful. So in my consulting practice, I do BI implementation for big, small companies, but there is a pervasive requirement that not all data are in relational databases. They're still being maintained in files, or sometimes you might want to integrate with some software as a service application and you have to go and download files because there is no better way. So where, where do we put these files? Traditionally, we're going to put them on file shares. We're going to put in FTP, but now you can have a data lake. And when you say data lake, James probably is going to talk about this. People think that you have to be a large organization and this is all about big data. It doesn't have to be. You can actually implement it, you can put it on Azure. It's very cost effective. It's like a, a few cents per gigabyte or something like that. And you can centralize all of these files that you have today in one place. You can put security around it and actually you can uh, consume it in a different way. So um, if you haven't subscribed to James blog, I highly recommend you do. You are missing a lot. He's a, he actually will introduce himself, but he's an expert, he used to be a consultant, and now he is actually working for Microsoft. His area is uh, Synapse, Data Lake, and I personally enjoy his blog a lot. I learn a lot of stuff from it. With that said, James, uh, the floor is yours. Um, thank you for joining us. Sure. Well, <laughs> thanks for that great introduction. I'm going to jump over to my screen and start talking about the data lake. And I don't like to have a lot of slides, but this is one of those cases where it's more of a concept, so there's not a lot of demoing I can do, but I will certainly jump onto the Azure platform at certain uh, pieces of 
slides to, to go into a little bit of a demo. And <clears throat> uh, quickly about me, I've been doing this quite a long time. That's about enough as I want to say. I won't go back to my COBOL days, but I, I currently work at Microsoft as a data and AI architect at the Microsoft Technology Center in New York City. And I spend most of my days engaged with customers talking about topics such as a modern data warehouse, Power BI is very popular now, especially when it comes down to security and governance. And recent product announcements like Purview, I've been demoing quite frequently. Synapse is another one that's gotten a lot of play. And most of all these topics have one particular product or concept that's related is data lake. Every customer that I talk to is using a data lake. Now these are mostly Fortune 500 companies, but you, you'll quickly see the benefits of having a data lake no matter what your end result is. If you're trying to get insights out of the data, then you're most likely going to want to start off with a data lake. So the agenda for today, and, and I'll pause at various times to answer some questions. I'll keep an eye on the chat. And, and so I'll start off talking about big lake data architectures, what that looks at a high level. Uh, why you want to use a data lake, a uh, little bit about top down and bottom up when it comes to building a solution, go a little bit more in a data lake to find, and then where I'll start doing a little bit of demo is I'll talk about how do you create a, a data lake store Gen 2, which is the Microsoft product for creating data lake, and then something about, some a little bit about use cases if we have time. I'll try to uh, spend time pausing to answer questions, but also at the end too. When we look at architectures, I break it out into four that I see most common with customers who want to have a discussion on using a data lake. And the first one as well, they have an enterprise data warehouse, usually on-prem, but they're having issues with it. It can't handle any, any of this big data, whether that is because of the size of the data or type or the speed of the data, they're running out of resources, and they want to create a solution to handle data in Azure and handle this data that they can't pull into their on-prem solution. So what they'll do is they'll create this data lake and you can use Hadoop for that underlying with data lake storage Gen 2 is HDFS, Hadoop's distributed file system. And they will use that to land this new data and it's not really a data lake but more of a data hub and the challenge with this is that a benefit of the data lake is to offload your data warehouse work and you can't do it in this environment because your enterprise data warehouse work is stay, staying on prem and also then it becomes difficult joining the two data because you may have new data that you're pulling in into this data hub and you want to join it with on-prem data. So that becomes very challenging. And if you're using reporting tools, then they use your reporting to one or the other, not both of them. So this is sort of a stopgap measure to handle this new data and maybe get insights out of it. And, and then in the future, you'll move to one of these other solutions. Second one I, I'll see is customers will create this data hub as a temporary staging area for refining the data. So maybe they're pulling in new data and they eventually want this data to land in enterprise data warehouse, which could be on-prem or in the cloud, and they want to clean this data and, and maybe join this data together. So they create this temporary area where they do all that. So this solution could be a, a Hadoop solution in the cloud, or it could be something that they do on-prem creating a on-prem Hadoop, which is very rare nowadays. Everybody's going getting away from that, but I will see this more often in the cloud and they create this temporary area. They land data in there, they clean it, and then they move it onto the enterprise data warehouse, especially if the data warehouse is on-prem. So they can not have to go and clean that data within a data warehouse because another challenge is they may be running this maintenance window and they're just out of time 
and they can't put any more cleaning in there, so they do it in this temporary area. And so a con of this is that because it's temporary, you're not doing any reporting from it. It has to then move on to the enterprise data warehouse, which you'll see is one of the benefits of having a data lake is you can start using it right away before it moves to enterprise data warehouse. The third solution is something I had to talk about quite frequently a few years ago, where companies said, we're just going to create a, a, this data lake and we're going to put everything in there. We don't need a relational database. Now, this has taken quite an interesting turn recently because I wrote this blog to say, don't ever think about not using a relational database on there. Don't get rid of your relational databases. I have many horror stories where companies try that and they fail miserably. The idea being is you want to have both a data lake and a data, a data relational data warehouse. And what I'll talk about how this is changing a bit recently with Synapse, but if you have a relational data warehouse, don't think about replacing that with a data lake. Think about something. So don't try to create a new solution just using a data lake with a lot of caveat I'll talk about in the future. But this is one that's extremely rare for a company to do it. I've only seen this been successful in a couple of use cases where you had a bunch of data scientists who wanted to use the data. And I said, as long as you're not going to allow end users to use this data, this could work. And in one case, it worked. In one case, they decided they needed to use end users, and then it failed miserably. So what you're most likely going to want to do is <clears throat> create a data lake in conjunction with your enterprise data warehouse. And we call this the modern data warehouse approach. This, this architecture is where you're using the data lake as the first stop for all your data, you're cleaning it there before moving it on to an enterprise data warehouse. You have BI tools that can use data that's sitting in a data lake, and that could be it, or it could use data that's been moved to enterprise data warehouse where it can combine the two. So this is the solution that I'm seeing all the customers have, well, have been doing for, for the last number of years. And we'll get into the, the additional benefits you get with having the data lake and not just enterprise data warehouse and, and that relational piece of it. So I'll point out one right away, and I was a DBA for many years before the data lake concept came around. And the thing that I had the most trouble with was the cleaning of the data. I had to have this maintenance window to knock people off the enterprise data warehouse, land data and staging tables there, clean the data, put it into the production tables, and then allow people back on. But with the data lake now, I can land all that data in the data lake, clean it separately, and then when it's ready, after it's cleaned, then I can move it into an enterprise data warehouse. So instead of having knock people off for sometimes overnight, I only have to knock them off. We're not even that, but maybe have a couple of minutes of interruption while the data is being loaded, but it's already been cleaned. So that's a very brief period of time. So that's just one of many reasons for a data lake. how this looks at a high level. <clears throat> when you have a modern data warehouse, I break it into four areas, ingest, store, prep, and model the data. As you can see, there's a lot of products that you can use in a Microsoft stack. And I could probably spend two weeks just talking about all these products. But the one that is used is this store. And we're going to be talking about a data lake store gen two. There's other options in there, but for the most part, everybody's going to the data lake gen two if they're going to be in the cloud. So the idea is you just the data landed into the data lake, you transform and clean it there, and then you move some of that data into a relational database. In most cases now that is Synapse Analytics, which was previously called SQL Data Warehouse. But that Synapse has opened up a whole other world of dealing with data. That, that I'll talk about in, in, a, in a second. Uh, the way it, I, I now call it the old school way of doing things was to take data and, and, and use an ETL tool like Data Factory, land it into the data lake store. This is, this is your data lake, and then use Databricks to clean this data, and then take that clean data and land it into the data warehouse. 
and then maybe you can go into Azure Analysis Services or Power BI. Most most cases, this is going away, and everybody's doing it in Power BI. James, can I ask you a question here? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I would like to ask you, and I, I know you had a blog about this, but I think one of the issues that I see that actually this many companies take this architecture to the heart very seriously, and when they when the source data is in relational databases so imagine you, you know it's in sql server you have to get some data from erp system oracle or sql server what they do they use they follow this and they actually uh materialize that data to the data lake in flat files only then to put it in staging tables in the data warehouse and actually populate the the dw right so based on your experience, would you advise uh, would you advise us to follow always this pattern? Or would you say if the data is in relational database and therefore a perfect <clears throat> store because you can query it, you can do it, uh, great things with it, you know, we can bypass staging the data to the data lake and then just put it directly into the data warehouse, into the staging tables and do the final transformation. What is your take on that? I say there are cases when you can bypass the data lake. Now, I always mention to customers that there is no cookie cutter way for every piece of data. There's going to be some data that's going to follow the full pattern. There are other data that you're going to take shortcuts in. So right. to your point, and I hear this question a lot, is if it's in a relational database, do I need to go put it in a data lake only to put it in a relational database again? Now, there are some features you'll miss out of, which I'll talk about in a little bit. By doing that, for example, if that data needs to be cleaned, well, now where are you going to clean it? You have to, are you going to clean it in a data warehouse or do it before that? So you're missing out on that. There, you, you, you could be landing data in the data lake, keeping it in its raw format for historical purposes and keep it forever, where you typically don't do that in a relational database. You maybe keep data that's a day or two old, but you don't. Anything older than that, you delete it because you don't have room in a database. Well, in the data lake, you can keep it forever. Hmm. However, when customers come to me and if they built solutions on prem and are moving them to the cloud, for example, I'll have customers say, we wrote SSIS packages and we have a thousand of them and we're going to move these to the cloud. I don't want to have to go and rewrite all of these to go and land in a data lake. Can I just bypass that? And it's, sure, that's a great use case for bypassing it. Being aware, you're going to miss out some of the features. And if you land stuff in a data lake and somebody wants to query it and they need stuff that's not in there, but it's in the data warehouse, they're going to have to kind of go backwards and move that data from the data warehouse into the data lake. And so, so it gets a little messy. So that's the long answer. But the so short answer is yes, I see cases where it may make sense to bypass the data lake. Cool. Thank you. So this is the old school way, and if, if, if you have questions, feel free to unmute yourself too. The new way, which, is, which has come about with Synapse, and Synapse has opened up a whole other way of interfacing with the data lake that you see here. The big difference is the ability to use a, SQL, a serverless pool and use T-SQL on the data sitting in the data lake, which was not available before. It used to be if the data leads in a data lake and I want to query it, I'd have to go to Databricks, create a cluster, fire it up, open a notebook, write some syntax in a, a various language that Databricks supports, connect to the data lake, and then query it using a variation of SQL, something like Spark SQL. Well, that was cumbersome. And the biggest problem was the cost, the time, and then not being able to use T-SQL. Well, now with SQL serverless, you can do this directly. In fact, this is probably a good case to just show you a little bit of that. If I go to the Synapse, and if I click on my demo here, and I go to this data tab, and if I open up this area called linked, where I've linked a data lake. And looking inside this data lake, I have all these folders. One of the folders could be 
Twitter data that's got some parquet data in there. So remember I said, just mention all the steps you need to go to query this parquet file in Databricks. With Synapse, I right click it, go new SQL script, go select top 100. And when I click run, you'll see I have this built in, that's the serverless feature. And the magic is this open row set that allows me to use this bulk feature that points to the file I want to query. And then within usually about, it's taking a little longer than I expected. It usually takes about 10 seconds for me to first do it because it's got to warm up this serverless feature. Once it warmed up, if I do this again, it's going to take uh, not even a second. And I have this parquet file here. So that compared to doing that data bricks is, is night and day. I can even do things like get all the parquet files that are in there, not just that one. And you see how quickly that came. And this is regular T-SQL, so I can just go and type in a regular SQL and use that, the regular T-SQL. And you'll see how quickly that returns. And now I can make, I can create a view on this and call the view. But this is such a big enhancement compared to the old way of doing it. So this is where we've see Synapse starting to be used. And in some rare cases saying, I don't even need a relational database anymore because, hey, I can just use T-SQL on the data sitting in a data lake. Now there's all these other trade-offs you got to think about, and I have a blog about that, but it, it is opening a new world for doing almost everything inside of a data lake. And then Synapse gives this new world of a modern data warehouse where I have all these options now along those different stages. I can use, I can continue using Spark. So this is a, this is not Databricks, but our, our Microsoft has put in here an open source Spark. So I can use that, or I can use the serverless function, or I can use data factory pipelines at each of these stages, including the, the, the um, exploring like I was doing or cleaning the data. I can use Continue to use Spark, T-SQL, Azure Data Factory uh, on there. So a lot, a lot of interest. This is where customers, where you're not hearing this new word called the data lake house, but you're combining the data lake and the data warehouse into one. And um, and so, and I'll, and, yeah, and I'll show these slides afterwards. So this is an approach for Synapse. And the question was Delta Lake. Delta Lake was created by Databricks. So there is a Databricks Delta Lake version, but they also open sourced it. So there is a Delta Lake open source feature. Within Synapse, it will, you, it has an option, a feature in there to use the open source Delta Lake feature. So customers are using it already for, for query and data that's sitting in a delta lake inside of their data lake store gen 2. Now there are some, I won't get into it much, but there are some caveats. If you want to use serverless or do you want to use dedicated to query it, you want to use Spark to query it. We support it in Spark. We are soon will support it in the serverless and farther down the road is supporting it into dedicated SQL. All right. Any other questions? Well, James, quick question. Um, when you said um, that Azure Analysis Services uh, basically will be gone, right? So why do you think? It's because it's coming in Synapse and this uh, a modern architectures for that warehouse that you're mentioning? <clears throat> or? Yeah, so in here I talk about Azure Analysis Services and I may have opened a can of worms, but first reason is Power BI now has, because of, of, of a number of new features in there, you can think of Power BI as a superset of Azure Analysis Services. And Power BI has almost all the features that were in Azure Analysis Services. So most customers, if they're using Power BI, don't need Analysis Services because if I need to access, and I'll, before if I need to use a tool to access Analysis Services, I couldn't use that same tool in Power BI, but now you can with, with this thing called XMLA 
endpoints in there. So I can, I can have that underlying model in Power BI, that tabular model, can be accessed outside of Power BI. In addition, Power BI has more features like aggregated tables and, and whatnot that can be used that are not part of analysis services. So that's one reason why customers are not using analysis services. Now, if they come to me and say, well, we're not using Power BI, we're using some other third-party reporting tool, okay, well, maybe they want to use analysis services in that case. However, if they are using Synapse, it's now possible to use reporting tools, dashboards against Synapse because of certain features in there. One's called materialized views and one is called results of caching. And they can allow you to get a lot of high concurrency, a lot of speed, and take away the need to use analysis services. But that doesn't take every use case. So there are still situations where customers will, will continue to use analysis services. But I see the future of that being much, much less. So James, just kind of, a, if yes. I may, in a poor attempt to kind of simplify this for Gustavo. Gustavo, um, analysis services, it's in many places. Power BI behind it, when you go and deploy a small data set or a large data set, you know, this is analysis services. Then you have it, uh, you have another SKU, which is Azure Analysis Services, then you have it on-prem. So what James is saying is that the idea about analysis, Azure Analysis Services that doesn't go away. You know, it's still very important to have that semantic layer, but you have an option where to deploy the that semantic model. And because Power BI, think of it like the highest queue of analysis services hosting uh, implementation, then it makes sense if you own Power BI Premium to actually go and deploy it in there because of the some of the features that we only have in Power BI, such as composite model that I showed you before. Does that make sense? So you have a flexibility. Use Power BI, maybe put it there. Don't use it. Azure Analysis Services is second best, maybe. All right. Thank you, guys. Yeah, it could be a long conversation. And when I talk to customers, I will ask them a lot of questions before I decide whether they should continue using analysis services or not. So unfortunately, it's not an easy thing to answer. But um, right. yeah, but uh, hopefully we Yeah, I mean, we, especially where basically Azure Analysis Services is uh, taking some segmentation of the data that you are protecting very well, right? And you have the role level security and the performance and so on. So yeah. there are so many use cases that why, that's why I was asking um, why, but makes sense uh, in some point. <laughs> yeah. This will happen. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I think, it. yeah, it, it'll be around for a while and there'll always be certain use cases for it. But um, I think for the, for any customer that has never created anything in analysis services or not using SSAS, it's it's most likely they're not going to need analysis services if they're using Power BI. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Ryan asked about Spark being cheaper than Databricks. I don't think I said it was cheaper. Uh, if I did, I apologize. I didn't mean to say it's cheaper. I don't get into costs too much with customers on there. I I. I will say that, as I showed you, it could be a lot easier to use Spark within Synapse. I mean, it's not part of this demo, but the open source Spark within there is integrated very well with the data lake, and you can attach to it and query using Spark SQL or Python and do a lot of what Databricks can do. Now, because this is another can of worms, customers will ask, do I ever need to use Databricks again? Well, if you're currently using Databricks, go ahead and keep using it. If you've never used Databricks, I would say try to get away from using Spark at all. Why would, why would you want to use Spark if I can use a tool that's much easier? So if you look at Data Factory with the mapping data flows and, 
and power and, and having wrangling data flows, which is in Power BI, or Data Factory, which is Power Query, which we have in Power BI, you can do a lot of the cleaning in a visual tool that's a lot easier. But at some point, if you say, oh, I need to do something in Spark because Data Factory doesn't support it, then your first stop may be, well, let's see if we can just use open source Spark within Synapse because it's, it's very easy and integrated well. And I'm, in that case, I'm staying within the modern data warehouse. I'm, I'm building a solution that is a modern data warehouse. Outside of that, if I'm a data scientist and I want to train a model, I'm not going to go into Synapse and use Spark in there. I'm going to use Databricks. So um, a lot of different questions to ask a customer. But the bottom line, if they need to use some light, seek, light Spark, they're most likely just going to use open source Spark if they're not already using Databricks. All right, cool, great questions. Um, so the data lake is great at handling all these different types of data. Structured, again, you don't always have to put all structured data in there, but if you, if you have structured data, unstructured data, streaming data, all these work really well as a landing zone for in the data lake where they would be extremely challenging, if not impossible, to put that in the relational database. And when I talk about big data, I really talk about all data, no matter, it doesn't mean it's necessarily big. If you look at three Vs, big data could mean a lot of high level volume, but it also could mean velocity, the speed of what the data is coming in, and it also can mean the variety. Is it semi-structured parquet files? So I think of, I want to have a solution that can handle big data will be meaning I can handle it no matter what the size, the speed, or the type. And what we have <clears throat> as a different way of, of looking at things is this approach that the old school way was the top down, where I know the question, I'm going to build a solution. I want to get insights out of this data. I, I know the questions to ask. I'm going to do some upfront work, maybe a lot of upfront work. And I'm going to, for example, go to SQL Server. I'm going to create the database. I'm going to create tables. I'm going to create the schema. I'm going to do referential integrity. I'm going to write ETL. I'm going to land the data in there. And then I'm going to query the data to generate those reports. So I'm modeling, I'll do all that upfront. So it could take a while to get the answer. Bottoms up is a, an, another approach where you don't know the questions to ask. I'm going to explore. I'm going to see what this data is, see if it has any value. Maybe do some queries and aggregate things and see what I come up with. And you saw how easy I can do that without any upfront work. I could just right click the files that's sitting in a data lake. And this is especially great for those data scientists who just want to see if this data has value before they go and create all this work to land it into a relational database. And the idea is you'll, you can do that later if you find it's got value. And the top down is great for historical reasons to, to look at the data. What happened, why did it happen? Those historical operational type of reports where the bottoms up is great for predictive analytics. Being that data scientist is gonna build a model to do to predict customer churn, for example, on there. So we have these two different ways of using the data that used to be quite separate. Now they're combining this where you take this data late warehouse that uses that top-down approach with all that work I talked about. You take a data lake that has a bottom-up approach where I take all this data, land it in the data lake, and then I run queries on top of that. The idea of this data lake house that many are calling is to combine that all into one solution. And that's where Synapse is, does a great job of it, is the ability to access relational database and data in the data lake using regular T-SQL. And then I can do all four of these things, uh, 
predictive and descriptive analytics without having to go and use separate tools or separate solutions on there, putting it all in one single pane of glass to gather and insights out of this data. So what is exactly is a data lake? And th this slide started out a number of years ago with I think four or five bullet points, and now I got so many I, I don't have time to talk about them all. I just highlight a few of them here. So this is when someone says, should I use a data lake? Boom, here's all the options we can talk about. And if they say, I want to skip the data lake and go right from a relational database into another relational database, okay, as I mentioned before, that there could be a use case for that, but read through this list to see what you're gonna miss out on and see if it's worth it. And most times customers say, well, you know what, eventually I wanna get everything in the data lake, but for now, I'll skip it for certain relational databases, and then later we'll go back and start using the data lake. Um, so I, I mentioned the big one of cleaning the data, but you can also explore the data, as you saw when I went into Synapse, I can do that right away now. So I remember from my DBA days, the challenge of somebody coming to me and saying, I, we have this data, can you put it in the relational database? We wanna generate reports off that. So I'd go and create the database and the table, and write the ETL and land the data in there. And then I say, okay, after a few weeks, it's available, go and use it. And then they come back a day later and say, oh, it turns out that data is not valuable. Well, I wasted all this time writing all this code on that. Well, now you can say, all right, you wanna use this? First, tell me if it's got value. Give me 10 seconds, I'm gonna put that data in the data lake and then go and right click it and look at it and tell me if it's got some worth. And if you play with it and you, they can even at that point, generate reports and say, oh yeah, you know what, this data is valuable. Well, we could have built a solution that they're done right there in the data lake, but most likely they're gonna say, okay, we wanna move it to a relational database, but at least now I know that you're gonna use it and not having to waste my, waste my time on that. And then the other thing I'll, I'll point out, the last one in bold is, when I have this data in the data lake, I have many options of cleaning that data. I could use Databricks, I could use Spark, I could use Data Factory. And each of those is the ability to scale up and use a lot of resources. And I can even say, I, I may want to have multiple Databricks clusters, each one of them on one particular folder in the data lake and they're all running. And so they're cleaning data really quickly. And that's something I can never do in a relational database. You're stuck to whatever that is set as performance-wise. And you also got to be careful because people are querying at the same time. So putting data in a data lake gives me a, a whole world of additional compute that I wouldn't have if I was just doing everything in a relational database. So I'll pause there for any questions. All right, I think we're good. So this is what we look at. The traditional approach was I have a bunch of data. I use ETL. I do all this upfront work to land it into a data warehouse. And then I do my BI analytics on top of that, and I'm monitoring things. This has worked fine for many years on-prem. But now comes all this additional data. It could be social media data, the Twitter data, IoT data, weather data, third party data. And how do I handle all that non relational data? Well, it's going to take a lot more time to ingest data. So now you start seeing companies monitor, uh, the, uh, they don't monitor it as, as much because they don't have the ability to do, to monitor all this data. There's a delay in, in, making the data available because uh, the maintenance window is enlarged. And then you have reports that sometimes get challenged because the maintenance window we went over that and they can't run reports. So there are delays. It's hard to, and uh, sometimes you just say, no, we can't have any more data in the on-prem. We're, we're maxed out. And so this causes all this uh, lack of innovation of getting more insights into your data. So the new approach, 
And think of this as instead of extract, transform, and load, it's ELT, load it and then transform it. As you take all this data, you load it in its natural form into a data lake, <coughs> clean it, and you land it back into a data lake. And then you can do reporting right off of it, that, or you, or you can also copy it to a, a relational data warehouse and do reporting off of, of that case. So this really solves the problem of big data with an ELT approach and with a data lake as a center of the universe in that. Questions on that? James, will you be sharing your slides? <laughs> yeah, I'll send it out right afterwards. I'll, I'll post it on the link or on the chat room too. So this is where I usually talk about the, what um, was brought up before is, can I bypass a data lake? This usually when people ask me at this point, that's why I put that arrow in, say, yes, you can. But I kind of already answered that. So think of this new shift, this paragraph shift is, the old way was to structure, ingest, and analyze, and the new way is to ingest it, analyze it, and if it's got value, then structure it. So the question usually at this point then becomes, well, if I put this data in a data lake, how do I organize the data lake? Because I don't want it to be that data swamp. So this is where customers, we have discussions, this sometimes can take a whole day on the, how, do I, how do I design this? So I can have layers and I can have, for example, a raw layer. So I copy the data as it is in there. And then I can clean the data and land it back in the data lake in the clean layer. And then maybe I join the data, master it, and land it back into a presentation layer of which then we can start querying and have end users access that data. I also usually will have a sandbox layer that's a copy of the data that is used for the data scientists if they want their own copy of that data. And what, one thing I've been seeing recently is this conform data layer that sits in between the raw and cleans, where customers are taking data that's in Parquet file, CSV file, JSON file. And the first thing they do is make it all one unified file type, which is usually Parquet. So it goes from raw into conform, that's all Parquet, and then it goes to clean the presentation. But there's, there's no cookie cutter or textbook way of doing this. Customers are all over the place. I, you won't even see consensus is what they call some of these layers. They have all sorts of names they come up with. But there's no wrong answer on this. It's just organize it the way that's most appropriate for your current environment. Within the data lake, within the layers, then you have to decide, well, how do I want to organize the folders? And this is a slide I got from Melissa Coates, where she gave examples of ways of having the folder structure on there. Do I want to have folders by partitioning by time, by subject area, by security, by confidential classifications? It just, there's so many options on there. And it's different if you're in a raw zone compared to a clean, compared to a presentation layer on there. And usually you have multiple options in there, multiple layer, multiple folder structures within the layers. For example, I can have a raw data zone that's broken up by subject area, which is a data source. So maybe Salesforce is the subject area. Then I have customer contacts and then broken it out by the day of the year. And that's where I land data on there. I'm, and then I most likely will do something different with the curated zone. And I may have that done separated by a purpose and a type and a, a, then a date on there. So lots of different ways of doing it in there. So I just tell customers to think through all this. You're probably not going to come up with the perfect solution up front. It'll change as things go on, but try to think through it enough so you're, you're pretty accurate in your first pass at the way you want to organize your data lake. So now if we have a data lake in a data warehouse, this slide kind of gives you a high level idea of the way to think about it. The data lake is, is generally your staging and preparation area. While you can do some serving, most customers, they move the data to a data warehouse and that's their serving layer and also their security and compliance layer because this is where it gets tricky. Data in a data lake, you can put 
you can do things like access control list in, in Azure and find who can go into the folder, who can read it and write and delete, but that's at the folder level. Well, if you have thousands of files in there, there's no concept of role level uh, security on it in a data lake in there. So to try to get over the complexity of putting all that type of security in a data lake, a lot of customers will say, we're just going to use the data warehouse for security and give everybody access to that, except for a handful of maybe high level uh, data scientists or high level end users that will use a data lake. Everybody else will use a data warehouse on there. But again, there's no right answer for this. It's usually a combination of the two, but it's something you just got to think through when you're building out a solution. Okay, so um, the answer for creating a data lake is Data Lake Store Gen 2. So this was a product that Microsoft came out, oh, it's probably been a couple of years now. And we used to have a thing called Blob Storage. We still have it. And then Data Lake Store, which is now, think of it as Gen 1. And it was always a problem with customers, which one to use. Data Lake Store was more for Hadoop type solutions. It had hierarchical namespaces, things that Blob Storage didn't support. And Data Lake Store was also for higher performance when you had the big data. But it, it was confusing to have two different types of systems for storage. And the Microsoft came out with Data Lake Store Gen 2, which kind of takes the best of both features and now puts it into this one product. And so very few customers are using Blob Storage anymore unless they've been using it. Anybody with a new solution is, in most cases, using Data Lake Store Gen 2. But if you are using something of APIs, because you can everything you do within a data lake, like you can do through the Azure portal, which I'll show you in a minute, or you can write APIs to interface with it. Well, if you wrote those interface those APIs with Blob Storage, and now that I move that data to Data Lake Storage Gen 2, which has its own APIs, you kind of out of luck until maybe probably been about a year now that Data Lake Store Gen 2 will support both APIs. It's called multi-protocol access, so you don't have to rewrite things in there. So that's where a lot of customers now are moving everything off of Blob Storage into Data Lake Store Gen 2. So this slide, which used to have a lot of things on there of limitations, now it's it's got very few. Understand though that Data Lake Store Gen 2 is built on top of Blob Storage. It's a layer on top of that that adds a little additional functionality. So you will see features, new features come into blob storage, like a soft delete that are not yet in Data Lake Store Gen 2, but usually take a, a month or two to, to, to become available. And these links here will go and allow you to see what's not yet in Gen 2. And these are some of the features that have come out recently that are in blob storage and in some cases are in Gen 2. And that's what that the link that I had before will will go into um, which which one it's in. But we've Microsoft is constantly adding these new features. And some of those are listed here that, that have, have gone G8 or in prior PD for the last couple of months in there. Some really cool stuff. So let me jump and I, I'll do some demos now. I don't want you to get too bored from all the slide decks on here. So if I go to the Azure portal and I want to create a data lake, I can go under storage accounts and everything I'm going to do, whether it's blob storage or data lake storage Gen 2, I'm going to create from here. And this is where it was a little confusing because before you were using data lake store, which is now called Gen 1, you'd have to go to another area of the portal no longer with gen 2 is you do everything underneath storage accounts so the difference being if i go in to create a storage account if i go to this advanced tab and you'll see here this data lake store gen 2 hierarchical namespace this is the switch that converts what is by default blob storage into data lake store gen 2 if I enable hierarchical namespace. And this is because blob storage doesn't have hierarchies. 
you can't have a folder that has a subfolder and so on. But you can do that in data like store Gen 2, and this is the way you turn it on, and that's when it officially becomes Gen 2. So you'll see there's a lot of features now in creating a data lake on here. A couple to point out is this replication. So if I, and well, actually there's another, if I go to um, East, each region has sometimes different features available to it. So the East region has a number of features available for it as a replication type, meaning if I land data in the data lake, by default, I have three copies of that data. This is high availability built in. You're not even aware of these other copies. Everything in Azure is like that. It's got three copies. So the durability, well, so while the, the, the SLAs that we guarantee are three nines, four nines, five nines, depending on what you choose, that's our guarantee that you'll be able to access that data. However, there's a different SLA for the durability meaning the chances of us of Microsoft losing that data that start at 13 or 11 nines. So in the seven years I've been at Microsoft, I've never seen a customer lose data. So that's the high availability. Now, to get additional nines, you can choose an option on here like the, the geo redundant storage that'll copy the data as it's landing in the data lake automatically to another Azure region that's paired with it. So you'll, You'll copy it locally, which gives you three copies of it. You copy that over to another region, which gives you another three copies of it. So you have six copies of that data. So you can do that for disaster recovery. You can do that to have that other copy of readable copy. So two people, so people can be just, can get, you can have a data lake close to where they live and then direct them towards that data lake with that data in there. So there's all sorts of things you can do. And, and But there's a lot of options here. I won't go all of them, but that's something to keep in mind when you're creating that. Obviously, there's more cost. So interesting, by default, it gives you this higher costing one. So you may want to go in here and choose LRS if you don't need to copy it over to another Azure region. So a lot of options on this one, but then you get into data protection and too many to talk about here, but there's all these new features they keep adding for help with recovering data, like a soft delete. If you accidentally delete something, you can go back and get it and such. So a lot of th different things you can do. Once you choose all this and you hit recreate in a matter of uh, a minute or under, you'll have a data lake. And if I go back, and look at what I've created here, you'll see it'll have on the overview page is what I chose as options. And then I can go through Storage Explorer here as a way to look inside of this data lake and create folders here and upload files to it that this way. So this is one way of doing it. Another way, the most popular way, is you can download and install Microsoft Azure Storage Explorer, this product, and then connect to your Synapse or your Azure subscription, and then you have the ability to go and look at the files this way and upload and download things. And then what a lot of customers do, because this is a manual way of doing, if they write APIs. So maybe I have, a, I have some job I wrote and I want to copy data into there, I can call APIs. Or I can use Azure Data Factory, or I can use SSIS. A lot of different ways of getting data into a data lake. All right, um, let me look at the question. So Brian had one. How does Purview fit into this flow? All right, I'll answer that. This is good because now I'm jumping out out of just talking about the data lake into ways of using the data lake, and purview is one. Assuming most of you on the call have never heard of purview, let me explain what it is. It is a new generation of Azure data catalog. <clears throat> the idea is I want to capture all the metadata of data that's landing in this data lake. So the problem is if I have people just 
just the ways I described, sort of putting all the data in here. How do I know what they put in here? How can I be alerted when they put something in or they shouldn't? Maybe I want to know if they put something that's got a social security number in here. So to prevent your data from coming a data swamp, you need to govern this. You need to keep track of all this. Well, you don't want to just go and have somebody visually look at these things and put what they find in an Excel spreadsheet. Instead, use a tool that can scan the data, capture the metadata, and land it into a place that I can search for it. So I can search and see what's in there for the purpose of I'm building a solution. I need some customer data. Is there already data out there in the data lake for customers? Let me search. Well, I don't want to, have to go through this and look through all the folders. I can use Azure Purview as a way, which I'll, I'll show you that screen to search for that. I can also use Azure Purview as a way of categorizing data that's put in there that could be PII data. So email addresses, social security numbers, addresses, it can track where it finds that, and then you can generate reports or get alerts to go and be notified of that data is in there. The way that looks, and I have this out here because I was just doing this right before this meeting with a customer, is this is Purview, and this is in public preview. You can go and use it now, and I'm going to give it just a few minutes overview of this, is I come into Purview. If I go here, I'll see this Purview accounts, and I can create a workspace, sort of just a, a, a high-level collection of where I want to store all the data. Usually, you can have one Purview account. Otherwise, you'll have data collected in one versus data collected in another, and, and there's no way to search across both. So you usually want to have one other than you maybe separating for prod, dev, and test. So when I create this Purview, I have this Purview Studio here. When I click on that, I go into Purview Studio. And the first thing I do is I go and I register a, 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 something I want to scan. So if I click register, you'll see we have 10 options here. Now, I'll focus on Data Lake Store Gen 2, but I can also collect the metadata of SQL Database, Power BI, on and on in here. And it also provides lineage of how this data has moved across because it also can scan data factory. So I can look at a data factory job and see where this data has moved across and come up and show you the lineage of how that data has flowed. So once I come in here and I link to data lake storage, I can then say, OK, I now want to scan it. So you see up here, I have this thing called new scans. If I click on this, um, you have to get permission to go and scan this. If I have the permission, what it'll first ask me, uh, let me go when I do have permission, is it'll first ask me, what do I want to scan? Instead of just scanning everything, maybe I'll, there's certain folders I don't want to bother scanning. OK, what about what files do you want to scan? By default, it'll scan all the files, but I can also come in here and say, well, there's a, there, I don't want to scan certain files, like maybe I don't want to scan JSON. So I can limit what I choose here. I can also choose the, what I want to scan and classify. By default, there's a whole bunch of classification rules in here. If I go in this, you'll see I, I have things like scanning for a German passport number. I have under financial scanning for credit card numbers and the personal I, I'll scan for email address and so on. But each one I scan for classification wise takes longer to scan. So maybe sometimes I don't want to scan those. And I also can define my own rules in there. So a common one is a customer, uh, a, a, a company may have a particular way they classify employees' IDs in there. So they want to put a rule in for that. So once I go and choose all that, then it's going to ask me, when do I want to run the scan? I can just run it now, or I can have it recurring every month or week or so. If the initial scan is full, and then it'll do an incremental. Once I do that, it comes back and says, this is what I found. And then I can go to the search and I can type in like cat customer and hit results. And it shows this is all the places I found customer. And I can click on that like an Azure SQL table. It'll show me the hierarchy of what it found. 
properties of that table, the schema, and then there's where it classifies things. It says, oh, look, I found email address and person's name. I can even do the lineage, which I'm going to jump to another screen where I had the lineage showed up. And so this is where you can see that this particular file came from an Azure table, went through Azure Data Factory copy, landed into blob storage, went again through Data Factory, landed in another storage, and it goes on and on. And this could be linked into Power BI to show it was pulled into Power BI, went into a data set, went into a report, went into a dashboard. That's how purview. So that hopefully answered your question. It is a data catalog that can keep track of everything that's landing in your data lake as well as other sources. Hello, this, is, right. uh, this is Ryan. I have a question. Can you hear me? Hello, right. James. Yep. Okay, perfect. Uh, two part question. One, uh, the first uh, part of the question is uh, with the um, point in time restore, uh, are you paying for the storage of each of the snapshots that you can restore? And then the second part of the question is with the purview. Um, <clears throat> when you're, uh, when this is scanning for things like uh, phone numbers and social security numbers and all that, is it just looking at the metadata or is it doing some type of advanced pattern uh, matching uh, to try to find that in the actual data? Regardless of what the name okay. of that particular data field may be. Yeah. So the first question of point in time restore. Are you talking about what storage? The data oh, well, lake? Yeah, for the data lake. Yeah. That's those are one of the features that you mentioned uh, that was available. One of the new features. The point well, in time yeah, restore. It's, yeah, it's 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 um they have a thing called one thing they have is called versioning. So each time you put a new version out there, they can keep track of that. So you can go back to prior versions if you need. You can also snapshot things. There's a few ways. There's a soft delete option. They all cost more. Okay. I like to say they're cheap. They are cheap, but everything adds up depending on how many files you have. So keep that in mind as you choose some of these options, there may be additional costs for it, especially if you replicate the data over someplace else. You're essentially doubling your cost. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And the second question was on, oh gosh, no, I forgot. <laughs> it was about the uh, the purview uh, with the, uh, you know, when, when you're doing the scan, if you're scanning for things like social security numbers, phone numbers, and things of that nature, is it just getting information from the metadata or is it actually yeah. doing pattern matching on the actual data? Yes. Um, it So this is interesting. It goes out and scans and it looks at the metadata. Then it goes and it looks at the actual data because it needs that to see if that is matching one of the classifications like a social security number. So it's going to read the data. It reads a few hundred rows, I believe. Okay. And from that comes up with a confidence that, okay, this is a social security number. Now it doesn't store that data. It just reads it. Now there is talk about maybe they may store some of that data because think of it, if you go and look at the, at this, and it says, I choose customer and I look at it and it has all these fields. I may not understand what the column name is, so I may want to go look at the data. Well, the way to do that now is if you see over here in the top right, this open a Power BI desktop. So depending on what you're looking at, I have options to click and see that data, but it's not that data is still remaining separate. The only thing it's helping me here is it's given me the connection information so I can open it. Okay. So most likely this will be the way going forward. There has been talk about pulling in some of the data as a sample, so it's easier to view it, but that's a whole bunch of other security things that they got to think about. And then it's going to make a lot more data that's going to be put in the cloud. So I don't know if they're going to do that, but to have this option making it very easy to go and see that data is is what they've done for now at least okay all right thanks a lot for the answers yeah right andy everything is cheap when it's someone else's money so that's the great thing about working at microsoft i say i don't care it's everything's free to me and i tell the customer to go and don't worry about money they don't use but they don't usually like that so 
um, it, it becomes interesting because with customers, I can talk about a solution and they may go, well, what's the cost? And then we talk about the cost and they go, well, we don't want to spend that much. Can you give us some other ideas of how to save money? And this is where it becomes trade-offs to go, well, okay, here's, here's something you can do to save money. So this is a data lake Gen 2 example is if I go into Data Explorer and I look at the files here, by default, I can say all these are in the hot layer. So there's a hot and there's a cool and an archive layer. So the idea is I can have everything in hot and I get the maximum performance, but if I wanted, if I'm okay with sacrificing, say, performance or an SLA, I could put that data into a cool or an archive. Each of those have different, you, you can go and look at a chart that'll show you the differences between all those. But we've made it very easy because if I look at this file, I can just right click it here and I can say change access here and I can change it to one of those other three, you can see. I don't have to move it to another folder. So you can see I'm in one folder and I have some that are hot and some that are cool in archive. Now archive, which is, I think 120th of the cost of cool is a trade off on that where you can't access the file directly once it's archived. I can't open it here. I'd have to move it. In fact, I think it'll tell me. I have to move it into a cool or, a, or hot, which will take some time on that. So that's a trade off. So I can save a bunch of, oh, it gives me an error because of that. Uh, so the idea is. I can put maybe data that's over, say, a year that's rarely if ever going to be accessed. I'll put that in archive, save a ton of money, and if somebody wants it, we can rehydrate that into cool or hot for them to use. So this is where we get into a lot of conversations with the customers about saving money by utilizing some of these features. All right, All right. perfect. So that's one way to save money. The reader said, what are the use cases for Data Lake Store Gen 2 compared to SQL Server 2019 big data clusters? I'll have to take a drink before that one. Big data clusters is a feature of SQL Server 2019 that allows you to do additional things on-prem, such as creating your own data lake on-prem. And it also allows you to scale out data, big data, and spread it out almost like sharding. This is part of what you do get in a data lake underneath the covers. And within big data clusters, I create, so it's interesting because customers, until this product came out, Microsoft never had a way to create your own data lake on-prem. We did at one time, a number of years ago, when we got rid of that product, but until the, the, that, Recently, you, you, if you wanted to create an on-prem data lake, you'd have to use Hortonworks or Cloudera, or any of those other third parties in there. Now, with big data clusters, you can create your own on-prem data lake. And a lot of things I talked about, Synapse, with using T-SQL against that data, can be done in big data clusters. The big difference, though, with big data clusters is an IaaS solution versus Synapse as a PaaS solution. So to build it and maintain it, there's a lot of extra work in big data clusters. But I will see customers who can't go into the cloud use big data clusters to ingest big data. So the really the difference between, so, so Data Lake Store Gen 2 is essentially what big data clusters is using on-prem. It's not the exact same thing. It's, it's a sort of a variation of it. So, um, so you won't see all the features that you see in that portal I was going through with Data Lake Store Gen 2 in Azure on there. So it really comes down to the question of can you use the cloud or not? If not, and you need a data lake, you may look at big data clusters. <clears throat> all right, that did it. Okay, I have a one quick question. Um, you mentioned earlier about uh, not recommending doing uh, having using the uh, a data lake as your 
uh, repository for a, a data warehouse. Uh, but uh, we also mentioned uh, the uh, feature that you have in uh, Azure Synapse with the uh, SQL uh, serverless. So with SQL serverless, does that um, remove all the, uh, uh, the negative uh, aspects of having a, uh, a data warehouse in a data lake? Because, you, you know, or, do you, or, or will you not even recommend SQL serverless as your repository for a, uh, a data warehouse? Yeah. The, and this could be a long conversation, but I'll, I'll try to give the summary of what I usually talk to customers about is that you can think of a data lake as the ability to land any type of file in there and not have to do any work beforehand. It's storage. There's no compute. I can easily upload and put files in there. Compare that to a relational database like SQL Server where I got to do a lot of work up front and I'm landing data in there in a relational format. Now, that could be a data warehouse, a traditional data warehouse, meaning I, it's a relational database. When I look at a data lake, I can do things with new features that make it data warehouse-like. So this is where it gets confusing to customers is I'm not making my data lake into a relational database, but rather I'm, I am making it data warehouse like in that it can do many of the things I can do in a relational database. And that's where you see this data lake house being called on that. So then it becomes, hey, can I put stuff in the data lake and I can just do any and everything I was able to do in a relational database? If, if so, then why do I need a relational database? Well, and that's the topic of the one of the blogs I have, or a couple of the blogs, is that there are some sacrifices. One is speed. For example, in a data lake, and I'm going to say this as a general term, but there are there are workarounds or other options. Is there's no indexing, there's no statistics, there's no query plan, so I can never get as fast a performance as I would get from a relational database. How much faster? Um, internally, we'll tell people at least five times faster you can get putting in a relational database. So then it becomes, is that acceptable? Well, it's it depends that you heard a million times. If I can run a query and it takes 10 seconds in a relational database and it takes 50 seconds in a, uh, using the same data in a data lake, is that acceptable or not? It depends on what the end users want. If it takes five seconds on a data lake and one in a relational database, five seconds may be fast enough. So the one trade off is the performance. The other is, I touched on before, is a role level security that I, that's not a feature in a data lake. Do I need that or not? Well, again, there's a lot of workarounds. You can say in Power BI, I can use role level security within it. Anyways, um, I'll, I'll put the link into my blog that goes more into that. A lot of it comes down to if I do everything in a data lake it, and I have a lot of sources, it's going to become very, very confusing to try to use that as the be all end all. And you're dealing in a file folder world that can be very complex with a lot of data sources. And it's worth the extra effort of creating a relational database and putting everything in there because you have the metadata along with the data. So uh, it's very easy for an end user to go and Oh, I'm going to create a report. Here's all the data. Here's the relational. Here's it, how it, it's all put together. It's a lot easier than, in many cases, going to a data lake and say, oh, your parquet files are sitting out there. Go for it. So that's the very short answer of something that can be a, a very long answer. Okay. Understood. Thanks. Yeah. Um, and, let's see. Beshwell had, it does all kinds of scans for column name matching patterns. Oh, yeah, various data catalogs use different AI to figure out classification. So in, and I didn't show you this, in Purview, when I go to the classification rules, I can set up my own. Oops, I don't have one. Oh, oh here it is. Um, and this is where I specify a regex expressions of what do I want to find in there to signify that this is, in a case, host name. I can use it looking at the data or the column. I have these other thresholds for reducing false positives. So that's the way you can 
use that AI in essence to classify data that it's found. And they ask, how do I query Data Lake Store without Synapse? Storage Explorer, Data Studio, Data Factory. So those are tools you can use to copy the data, to query the data. If you're not going to use Synapse, you're going to have to use something like Databricks and open a notebook app and query it. Uh, there's some third-party tools. Even in Power BI, you have the ability to go and use a data lake as a source and pull it into Power BI and create a query and report off of that. Almost all third-party tools now support data lake store, so you can look through those because the great thing about the great thing about Synapse is, is, is it supports T-SQL. So what I'll see customers doing is they can create a view that's a select statement off of a file sitting in the data lake. And then any third party tool can access that view and query the data. So I can be querying the data in Power BI that's calling a view, which most customers are gonna think that's a relational database. Well, no, it's actually sitting in the data lake. And it's using the serverless compute. So you're only paying when the queries run. So that's a, a great way to save money too. So James, about this, do you know what's happening behind the scenes with this on-demand querying? Does it load the entire, um, all the files in memory before it does the predicates? Um, it, yeah, it is doing push down queries. So it has a SQL engine that is sitting next to the storage and that will query using a SQL engine and return just the results back into Synapse. And if you want details on that, this is where I'm going to my blog that's pointing to this Polaris. This paper that came out a few months ago goes into all those details. Hmm. It's um, not for the faint of heart when you get to this part where it's showing you these computations. Uh, you may want to skip over that part, but the other part of it, it goes into details of what it does behind the scenes. Gotcha. Because also it becomes, well, I don't want to have to have all these SQL engine clusters running all the time when nobody's using them. So it has those algorithms to determine if it should warm up and it's pretty sophisticated, but in the end, if, if at worst case you'll see, it'll take maybe 10 seconds to fire up if it's not warmed up. And once it's sure. warmed up, it's instantaneous. Oh, very impressive. Well, with respect of your time, James, maybe we can wrap this up. Um, I know that this is, has been a very interesting <laughs> presentation. I'm sure there's a lot of questions about this. Um, do you guys have any any last questions in the last five minutes or so um, for for yeah. James? Okay, okay, great talks. Thanks so much. And I just so really appreciate it if you can share the slides. Um, yes, I am going to upload it. If I can get in there, yeah, I will upload it right now. Meanwhile. There is a question. Can I use Open Role Set in Azure SQL instead of Synapse to load data in ERW from the data lake? All right, so this is the poly based thing, uh, James. What was the limitations? I guess Azure SQL probably is Azure SQL database or Azure SQL managed instance. Yeah, um, there, you're talking about here about this Open Row Set. Right. And that is a feature that is only in yeah. Synapse, at least for now. So I have heard internally about talks about making this available in SQL database, but not as yet. You'll have to use open row set within Synapse. Cool. Okay, any other questions? Well, I guess that's it. Well, James, thank you so much. This has been very useful and we we'll definitely uh, will invite you again.
to present if you're willing. Sure. It's a lot easier now when everything's virtual. <laughs> yes, it is. Where will the slides and the recordings be available? So the recording will be available in the next one hour to the this. I'm going to put the, the link again. Um, all the recordings go to YouTube. And uh, yeah, and I'm uploading the PDF. I don't know if it's going to work in this chat, but I'll. I'll um, it looks it like it looks like it didn't make it. Okay. Yeah, it never works for me because I. Uh, uh, it's you have to be on the same organization or something like this. But if you email that to me, yeah, I uh, okay. will try to put it somewhere now with pass actually shutting down uh well we'll figure out something yeah yeah it is it looks like it's not uploading so yeah i'll send it to you right now um or or if if, if people if you have issues or just want to um email me directly for it it's there's my email address any any follow-up questions happy to answer them Got you. And what we're going to do, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna put that slide deck back to the uh, our download section on the atlantabi.pass.org, our main website. So you guys have to be really quick to <laughs> to go and download it because I think we have ten days window before it shuts yeah. down. Oh yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for everyone who attended today's meeting. I'll see you. Oh, well, yeah, well, I'll meet you on the yeah. February 1st, where we're going to be talking about the Power yeah. Query. We're going to go back to Power BI. We're going to talk about Power Query transformations yeah. and such. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you guys for attending. Have a great evening. Bye. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, James. Yep, thanks guys.